Hello and welcome. This is the Daily Report for Tuesday, March 22nd. Russia's continued aggression in Ukraine is casting much doubt on global economic prospects. We have more later on in the program. Here first to the global pandemic tallies with our Kwon Soa. So let's start with the rebound here in Korea for this Tuesday. Right, Sunny. Just as much as cases have dropped on Monday, they have ticked up again this Tuesday to 353,980 as of 12 a.m. And uh, apart from 46 imported cases, the rest domestic transmissions. Now, although cases jumped uh, by close to 145,000 from the day before, uh, it actually marks a drop when we compare the figure to exactly a week ago on Tuesday. Slightly above 50 50% of new cases have occurred in the metropolitan region, including more than 96,000 in Gyeonggi-do province, followed by 65,000 in the capital's whole, and uh, also Busan and Gyeongsangnam-do province still seeing above 24,000 infections. And uh, with that, uh, Korea is close to hitting the 10 million mark in its accumulated caseload now at 9.9 million, and also the death toll has surpassed 13,000 with 384 new reported fatalities. And the number of patients in severe or critical condition is also remaining at above 1,000, however, a slight drop from the day before. On to our vaccination figures, meanwhile, 87.6% of the nation's population now has received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose, and 86.6% uh, are considered fully vaccinated, while with a little over 47,000 people having been administered with a booster shot the day before, that percentage stands at 63.2%. Now, globally, around 1.5 million new COVID-19 infections in the past day, and a little over 4,500 COVID-19 related deaths and uh, fueled by the stealth Omicron, the UK now has reported over 220,000 infections in the past day and also Germany still above 180,000 new infections. Uh, we also got six digit figures in Vietnam, which has uh, led to Vietnam reaching the 8 million mark in its total caseload. And those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so uh, thank you for the global tallies. Here in Korea, health authorities believe our Omicron peak may become a prolonged affair. For details, I turn now to Shin Yeun. Yeun, good to see you again. Great to be here, Sunny. Right, so the growing presence of stealth Omicron is looking to prolong our fight against this latest wave, Yeun. Tell us more. That's right, Sunny. While many health experts have been forecasting that the country will pass its Omicron peak by next week, officials say the growing number of stealth Omicron cases could prolong this wave, and this is mainly because other countries previously hit by Omicron, like the U.S. or U.K., have seen a fresh rebound in cases due to this subvariant. Now, take a listen to what the KDCA chief had to say during Monday's briefing. Stealth Omicron is known to be 30% more contagious than the original Omicron strain. It's also responsible for around 60% or even more COVID cases worldwide. Though this subvariant won't lead to a new wave of the pandemic, we do think it could prolong the current one we're in. So we will keep a close eye on its spread. Also known as BA2, Stealth Omicron is reportedly much more contagious than the original strain and already responsible for more than 40% of all locally transmitted cases. It also took up nearly 57% of all imported cases in the country as well. But there's no scientific evidence proving that the subvariant is more fatal than Omicron. And the most common symptoms of stealth Omicron is dizziness and fatigue, which usually appear two to three days after being infected. As suggested by its name, stealth Omicron has been difficult to detect with current PCR test kits that are used widely across the globe. But Korea has been using a homegrown updated PCR test kit that is said to be affected in, effective in detecting all variants from Alpha to Delta and even all strains of Omicron. Right, yeah, now that is reassuring to know. But on a worrying note, the number of severe COVID-19 infections as well as that of fatalities, like Soa mentioned earlier, remain quite high in the country. How are officials responding? 
Well, for the third straight week, authorities have maintained their COVID-19 threat level at its highest mark, and this comes as roughly 7 out of 10 ICU beds are occupied nationwide amid a spike in the number of critically ill patients and deaths. In a week, we've seen the number of critically ill patients increase roughly 12%, and the number of weekly deaths jump by a whopping 45%. Korea is also running low on stocks of Paxlovid, the only antiviral pill that has received the green light from the country's drug regulator. That's why the government is planning to take delivery of some 100,000 courses of Lugevrio this week. Now, this is another oral COVID-19 pill, also known as Molnupiravir, manufactured by Merck. Though the government has a pre-purchase agreement for some 242,000 courses of Lugevrio, it hasn't yet been approved by the drug ministry, citing efficacy reasons. While Paxlovid was found to lower the rates of death and hospitalization by 90%, Lugevrio only only did so by 30%. But authorities have determined an alternative drug is needed to treat high-risk patients who cannot be prescribed with Paxlovid because of drug-to-drug -drug interactions with their other medications. As of now, only seniors age 60 and up, the immunocompromised, and those 40 and over with underlying conditions like diabetes or cardiovascular disease are eligible for the drugs. The country's drug regulator will make their final decision as to whether they will grant emergency use authorization for the Gavrio by Thursday at the latest. Right, and that would be Thursday this week then. Yes. All right, Ian, thank you for now. I uh, now turn back to Soa, who is at the desk, with Tuesday's morning briefing details from that, that is, right, Soa? Right, Sunny. Let's start with a question that has been dragging on for quite some time now. Will Korea soon observe a clear decline in COVID-19 cases? Now, based on the latest caseloads, including the roughly 354,000 infections that were reported on Tuesday, we are no more seeing weekly doubling effects, that's for sure. Also, comparing today's figure to last Tuesday, cases are even slightly lower. Now, this pattern has been showing since the weekend, with an official at Tuesday's government briefing saying this is an indication that we have entered the peak of the Omicron wave. He added, though, that we should monitor the rest of the week, especially as Wednesday's caseload usually acts as a key barometer for the weekly trend. Meanwhile, once we do reach the peak, the next question is how fast the country will experience a decline in cases. That's difficult to evaluate at this point, is what health official Hun young -ne says, with factors like a current rise in the use of rapid antigen tests as well as the BA2 subvariant uh, that Yeon earlier mentioned playing a role. The proportion of stealth Omicron cases is rising in Korea and when considering the fact that this subvariant is somewhat more transmissible than the original Omicron strain, we will have to wait and observe to make an accurate assessment on how the current outbreak may trend downward after reaching its peak. And uh, also he added that it's not easy to analyze uh, why some countries are seeing plunges in cases and some are seeing a decline in a more gradual manner after the Omicron peak. I see. Meanwhile, so I hear Korea's death toll and its uh, tally of critical cases were also addressed today. Right. Uh, the government is uh, preparing its medical capacity so that they can deal with uh, around 2,000 patients in severe or critical condition by the end of March or early April. And uh, Son young -ne noted that uh, the rate of increase in patients in such condition, however, is rising slower than expected. And he also suggested that COVID-19 may not be the actual cause of fatalities uh, in certain number of fatalities that are categorized as COVID-19 deaths. Let's take a listen. Between 20 and 25 percent of severe cases have been caused by worsening respiratory symptoms as a result of COVID-19 infection, as opposed to around 75 percent of patients with severe illnesses whose conditions were triggered by an aggravation of their underlying health issues. Nonetheless, so given the rising number of COVID-19 related fatalities then, authorities have spoken about efforts to tackle the challenges faced by crematoriums. Right, Sunny, and uh, Yen actually uh, yesterday touched upon the issue of fully booked crematoriums and this Tuesday authorities vowed to do more in dealing with those shortages. The government has increased operations of crematoriums nationwide since uh, last Wednesday with a daily cremation capacity having been increased from around 1,000 
1,000 to 1,400. But uh, as the gap by region differs a lot, the government decided to expand their operation to seven cremations per one facility nationwide, a guideline that had been in effect in the metropolitan region and big cities only. Also, authorities have requested all 1,136 funeral homes in the country to accept the remains of those who died from COVID-19 for all kinds of funeral proceedings, just like any others that have lost their lives from other causes. Right, I see. Right, so then let's expand our talk to include Yeun. Now, Yeun, regardless of our Omicron tallies, authorities here remain committed to easing restrictions, right? That's right, and some health experts are definitely concerned about this because we may see a further rise in our daily figure after the limit on private gatherings has been extended from six to eight people from Monday. But the KDCA chief explained earlier that authorities believe toughening social distancing measures may not be the most effective way to tackle Omicron. Take a listen to what Cholin Gyeong had to say. Because Omicron is so contagious, we realized we couldn't contain it just by using social distancing measures. So we've decided to take a more complex approach, strengthening antivirus measures in our daily lives, encouraging testing to discover infections earlier, promoting more vaccination, and bringing in more antiviral pills. Right, bringing in more treatment options then. So I hear stealth Omicron is also a cause of concern within the academic arena. That's correct. Uh, and this as infections since the reopening of schools earlier uh, has gone up along with a rise in the general caseload. Uh, in the capital's whole alone, in the span of a week from the 14th to the 20th, close to 70,000 students and faculty have been infected with COVID-19. So roughly 10,000 every day. Uh, that's a rise by more than 11,000 from the week before. The group that had the highest proportion, proportion uh, were elementary kids, meaning those unvaccinated. In nearby Gyeonggi-do province, close to 120,000 infections occurred in the last week, uh, linked to students and faculty members. As part of ongoing inspections of education facilities, meanwhile, since the beginning of the new semester earlier this month, uh, Education Minister Yu Eun-hae checked the virus prevention measures at universities on Monday. And uh, speaking of universities, uh, the education ministry earlier in the day also had an announcement regarding Suning or this um, college entrance exam later this year in November. But it was interesting that they didn't really seem to have specifics about uh, the COVID-19 prevention measures, which were very important during last year's and the year before Suning. So uh, let's hope that uh, at this year's uh, the um, COVID-19 situation will improve much more. I'll keep my fingers crossed. All right, so as always, thank you very much for the coverage. And Yeon, thank you. See you on Wednesday. Thank you so much. The Ukrainian city of Mariupol is firmly holding its ground against surrender to Russia. Despite the atrocious aggressions, the city has been forced to endure over the past three weeks. Our Song Yujin has our top story. Ukraine's southern port city of Mariupol has been the victim of brutal bombardments for the past few weeks. And on Monday, Moscow demanded Ukrainians put down their arms and raise white flags in exchange for safe passage out of the city. But maintaining its defiance, Ukraine's answer was no. President Volodymyr Zelensky reaffirmed the country's stance on the same day. Zelensky told local media outlets that his country would never bow to Russia's ultimatums and cities including capital Kyiv and Mariupol would not fall into the hands of Moscow. Despite Ukraine's resistance, civilian atrocities are escalating every day. It has been officially established then in 25 days of the full-scale aggression, Kremlin has already killed 150 Ukrainian children, destroyed more than 400 schools and kindergartens, and more than 110 hospitals. Thousands and thousands of, of civilians were killed. 
Calling Moscow's brutality state terrorism, the defense minister warned international society that if the Kremlin is not stopped, what Ukraine faces today may become what they encounter tomorrow. Meanwhile, regarding the kidnapping of the mayor of Ukraine's Melitopol, Russia's human rights ombudswoman claimed on Monday local time that he was freed after being exchanged for nine captured Russian soldiers. She said this was the first hostage exchange between the two countries, adding that more than 500 Ukrainian soldiers have been captured by Russia. The mayor was reportedly kidnapped on March 11th by Russian forces, but President Zelensky's office said five days later that he was released without providing further details. Shelling and kidnapping are not the only parts of Russia's playbook, which also includes online attacks. Following U.S. President Joe Biden's statement released on Monday, the White House pressed businesses to tightly lock their digital doors. We've previously warned about the potential for Russia to conduct cyber attacks against the United States, including as a, re as a response to the unprecedented economic costs that the U.S. and allies and partners impose in response to Russia's further invasion of Ukraine. Today, we are reiterating those warnings. And we're doing so based on evolving threat intelligence that the Russian government is exploring options for potential cyber attacks on critical infrastructure in the United States. Against looming cyber threats, the Biden administration vowed to use every tool it had to deter, disrupt, and even respond to attacks. Song Yujin, Arirang News. And in related news, prospects of global starvation are plaguing the world community amid what pundits claim is the worst food insecurity level since the Second World War. Our Om Jiang explains. The war in Ukraine is foreshadowing a possible rise in world hunger as it is causing global food and fertilizer prices to soar. The New York Times reported Sunday local time that wheat prices have jumped by 21 percent since Russia's invasion of Ukraine last month. The price of barley soared by 33 percent and some fertilizers skyrocketed by around 40 percent. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development said Russia and Ukraine accounts for about a third of the world's wheat and barley exports. And a crucial portion of the world's fertilizers is trapped in Russia and Belarus. The advisor to head Ukrainian presidential office says the war has hammered the country's food exports. But it's going to severely limit the export, right? Because Odessa is our port now. Odessa is blockaded. So it cannot export. Even this year, we have about 5 million tons that we are still sitting and we cannot export them. And we won't be able to export them. Unlike. So it's already going to hit the uh, global supply chains now. The UN said this month that up to 13.1 million additional people could go hungry due to the war's influence on the global food market. In February, grocery prices in the United States jumped by nearly 9 percent compared to the same period a year earlier, the biggest increase in 40 years. But experts say the rise in food prices could deal a more severe blow to emerging markets and low-income countries. Wheat prices nearly doubled between January and February. Disruptions to wheat, maize and fertilizer supply can be a real threat to food security for many countries, especially emerging market economies and low-income countries. Coupled with China's poorest wheat harvest in decades and shipping constraints amid the COVID-19 pandemic, officials have also warned that the war could lead to global hunger. Om Jiyong, Arirang News. Over in the U.S., the Federal Reserve has shared plans to adopt an aggressive monetary policy to tame inflation. Our Kim hyo -san has more. U.S. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell has vowed to take more decisive action to tackle inflation, which he said jeopardizes an otherwise strong economic recovery. Addressing the National Association for Business Economics on Monday, he explained that the American labor market is robust, but inflation is, quote, much too high. Powell pledged that the central bank would take all necessary steps to ensure a return to price stability. 
More specifically, he added that if the Fed sees it necessary to move more aggressively by raising the federal funds rate by more than 25 basis points, it will do so. The remarks come less than a week after the Fed raised interest rates for the first time in over three years to tackle inflation, which has hit a four-decade high. The chief of the U.S. Central Bank also addressed a Russian invasion of Ukraine, explaining how it has been adding to supply chain and inflation pressures. Referring to the Fed's decision to shrink its $9 trillion U.S. dollar bond program, Powell noted that the process could begin as soon as May, but no final decision has been made yet. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Here on the local front, the recent lifting of mandatory isolation for fully vaccinated arrivals into the country has led to a surge in overseas travel reservations, our Kim Bo-kyung reports. The lift of the mandatory week-long quarantine on arrival has made travel lovers get ready for their long-desired overseas trips. According to major travel agencies in South Korea on Monday, after the health authorities announced the changes on March 11th to exempt those fully vaccinated from having to quarantine for seven days, sales of travel packages have soared. Hana Tour says 3,200 reservations were made for travel packages between March 11th and March 20th. That is a 93.7 percent increase from bookings that were made over the previous 10 days. The Pacific islands of Guam and Saipan were the most preferred travel destinations, with more than 36 percent of the bookings followed by Europe and the Americas. Bookings for plane tickets to overseas destinations are also on the rise. 7,300 people booked plane tickets from March 11th to 20th, which is more than a 60 percent increase from the 10 previous days. Sources say that they expect sales to increase even further. We are looking forward to more bookings in the future as preventive measures are being loosened in other countries. Airlines are now reopening regular flights too, so we are expecting the number of trips overseas to go up. Travel packages and plane tickets are not the only things enjoying a sales increase. E-Mart, a subsidiary of South Korean retail giant Sinsege Group, said on Tuesday that it saw a 42.4 percent increase on year in sales of travel suitcases, including carriers and portable bags, between March 12th and March 20th. Meanwhile, Incheon International Airport Corporation, too, is gearing up to welcome travelers and is expecting the demand for flights will properly recover starting this July. Kim bo Arirang News. Also on this Monday, that is, that's, that is Tuesday, that would be March 22nd, we mark the UN World Water Day. And in light of this occasion, our Ian Jin shares with us technological efforts here in the country to boost water management. Do take a look. A digital twin is where something from the real world is duplicated in the virtual world. And everything from appearance to live detailed information is updated on the digital twin in real time. This allows experts to run experiments on more realistic terms. Here in South Korea, this technology is being introduced for water management. The first was a twin of the Samjinggang River. The entire river valley has been duplicated in the virtual space. It contains all the information necessary for water management from the river's topography to its surrounding management facilities. This allows experts to predict what will happen along this river in accordance with rainfall forecasts. What experts are hoping for is this technology to be able to play a role in minimizing flood damage from heavy rainfall. Using a 3D topographic data, we cannot only check the changing water levels, but also prepare for any dangers from downstream obstructions by analyzing information like flood levels or flash flood warnings. On this World Water Day set by the United Nations, South Korea has announced a plan to integrate this advanced technology in the field of water management. Fourth industrial revolution technology such as AI and digital twin will play a key role in the competitiveness of the water industry. K-Water will open new horizons for water management by turning its extensive experience into data. South Korea looks to take the lead in smart water management through the digital construction of the nation's five major rivers, starting with the Samjinggang River. Ian Jin, Arirang News.
Vietnam has been fighting a rebound led by Omicron, but authorities say in recent days their daily tally has been retreating. For more, I have Michael Tatarski live on the line. Michael, it's good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Let's start with a bit on the Omicron situation there in Vietnam, Michael. Does the daily caseload appear to be on a tangible decline? Uh, at the moment, yes. Uh, I mean, yesterday was around 160,000 cases, which is much lower than some of the day days in the last week, which have been over two or 300,000. Um, although tracking it day by day is a little bit tricky. We don't really know how much testing is going on on a daily basis. Um, but at the moment, cases do appear to be going down from a very high number, uh, but we'll still have to see how that goes in the coming days. Right. Michael, on the vaccination front then, Vietnam appears to have an aggressive campaign in place with further plans in the works to inoculate children as young as three years old. Do tell us a bit more. Yeah, so after a slow start last year, um, Vietnam really didn't get going on vaccinations until the kind of July, August, September time frame. Um, it's become a, one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. Um, almost all um, valid adults or qualified adults are fully vaccinated. About half of the population has now received a third booster shot. There's even early discussions of potential fourth shots being distributed at some time later this year. Uh, we don't exactly know that timeline. Um, and yeah, as you said, they're also discussing children from three to five potentially getting vaccinated. Uh, but the the nearest step will be children from ages five to 11, uh, which they haven't been vaccinated at all yet, but that is expected to start in the coming months. Um, they've been working on 12 to 18 year olds over the last two or three months. And that, that, that age bracket is expected to be fully vaccinated by the end of April, I believe. Michael, staying with vaccinations, what has been the public response to plans by the government to inoculate children as young as three years old? Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of reporting on that yet. Um, and granted, these plans are fairly new. That's still in the early stages of discussion. Um, I think there will be a lot of concern probably from parents. You know, um, as with anywhere, kids are extremely important. Parents take their health very seriously. Um, but the reaction to 12 to 18 year olds has been strong. Um, there's been really no major issues with that. Um, obviously, younger kids are a, bit, a bigger question mark. But thus far, I would kind of expect it to continue with you know, largely people kind of going along with the vaccination campaign, which we've seen is working. I mean, the case numbers have been incredibly high recently, but the death rate has been very low, um, dropping even. Yesterday, they reported 69 COVID deaths nationwide. Um, of course, that's terrible, but that's well down from, from hundreds a day a few months ago. And again, even with these huge Omicron-related case spike, we haven't seen any related spike in mortality or severity. Right. Meanwhile, Michael, with regard to border restrictions, authorities there have reportedly announced the resumption of visa-free travel for citizens from 13 countries, including Korea. Do explain this ease in restriction for us. Yes, yeah, so this comes after uh, two years of the international tourism industry being completely shut down. Uh, there was a, a, a limited uh, tour vaccine passport program that started in, in November that saw people, a few people come in on charter flights and kind of restricted to just a few resorts. I think about 10,000 people visited under that since November, which is quite a small number. Um, so this has been talked about for a long time. You know, other countries in Southeast Asia have reopened in recent months to varying degrees. And uh, this is a tourism industry that was growing by leaps and bounds. Prior to COVID, a record almost 19 million visitors came in in 2019. Um, you know, South Korea is a, is a huge market for Vietnam, for example. So this was, under a lot of pressure from the tourism industry and also kind of seeing that widespread vaccination and a lack of there, there not being a spike in deaths or severe cases um, kind of allowed this to happen. Right. Michael, do tell us a bit more about the prerequisites for this visa exemption then. Yeah, so it's it's uh, quite a dramatic um, relaxation of rules. I think a lot of people were kind of caught by surprise by just how relaxed it is. So there's no quarantine. Um, you don't even have to show a proof of vaccination uh, to arrive. You just need a PCR test within 72 hours, a negative PCR test within 72 hours of departure, or a rapid test within 24 hours of departure from your home country. Um, and as long as that's negative, you can arrive and travel freely. Um, if you're on that visa waiver program, that is only for up to 15 days. They haven't brought back any longer tourist visas yet. There are also still some questions regarding travel insurance or health insurance and what happens if, if a tourist were to test positive while they're in Vietnam. Um, some of that is a little unclear, but on paper, at least, the regulations for entering are among the most generous in Southeast Asia now.
Right. And before you go, Michael, one final question. What can you share with us about the COVID-19 related restrictions over there in Vietnam at the moment? Uh, there largely aren't any. I mean, here in Ho Chi Minh City, at the very least, um, life is honestly back to almost pre-pandemic levels, I would say. I mean, mask people are still almost entirely wearing masks, but uh, traffic is uh, busier than it's been in, I think, at least a year, at least from what I've noticed. Um, schools are back. A lot of students have been getting COVID, but again, as far as we know, relatively mild. So there's been some disruption with schools, but restaurants, cinemas, uh, karaoke are all fully open. Um, domestic travel is quite easy. Um, I mean, some northern provinces have been a, a bit more of an issue thanks to their high Omicron caseloads, but there really aren't any significant restrictions in place and certainly nothing on the national level. Right. Well, that is good to know. All right, Michael, thank you for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thursday this week, we mark precisely one month since Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has, among other devastating realities, led to much uncertainty within the global economic arena. For more, I have Professor Ojin Sok from Sung Myung Women's University. Professor Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure. I also have Professor Yang Hidong from Iwa Women's University. Welcome back, Professor Yang. Thank you for inviting me. Right, Professor Oh, Russia recently mm -hmm. forestalled a potential default by making a 117 million US dollar payment to mm -hmm. foreign bond holders, but I hear the danger of a default remains high this year. Yeah, right. Uh, in 1998, Russia deport, uh, deported a local currency debt uh, at that time and then uh, declared a moratorium. Uh, Russia uh, can uh, decide his own selection at that time. But uh, now the situation is different because it is a foreign currency debt and the situation is totally different. Uh, even though the Russia wants to or wants to pay the interest rate uh, payment, uh, but the situation is uh, Russia cannot access, uh, access to the international settlement system. So it is not that easy for the uh, investors uh, to uh, receive the uh, uh, interest payment. Uh, and then in case Russia uh, doesn't pay uh, the uh, coupon interest in dollars, uh, then the creditor uh, would uh, have the right to declare the for it. Uh, Russia's finance minister said that the London branch of uh, paying uh, the agent Citibank has received, uh, as you mentioned, that $117 billion in total payment. Uh, while Russia uh, seems to have been able to meet this coupon payment in full, uh, but uh, Moscow, uh, Moscow wants to end then uh, wants, uh, wants to show their ability to pay international uh, debt, uh, but uh, it must be tested again and again. That's because uh, more payments are coming soon, uh, and then much uh, larger $2 uh, billion worth of payment are scheduled for early April. Uh, it could create an even bigger headache for Moscow. Uh, that is because the fund uh, that used to uh, make a, a payment comes from uh, Russia's frozen uh, foreign currency, uh, uh, which is sanctioned now. Uh, so it, uh, it is uh, what I'm saying that uh, it is it is very unclear uh, whether the investor really received their money or not. So JP Morgan estimate uh, that the Russia had about uh, 40 billion worth of foreign currency debt uh, as of last year, uh, with about half of that uh, held by foreign uh, investors. So a potential default would be bad news for Russia, uh, lacking access to the uh, international finance, and then Russia uh, will lose uh, the investment grade, uh, investment grade ratings. Uh, so. But uh, uh, it says that the global market probably uh, not that much get hurt uh, from the, the uh, Russia's deport. Right, hopefully though. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Uh, Professor Yang, what more can you tell us about the potential broader repercussions of Russia defaulting on its government debt? Well, the, as Professor O already mentioned, that we should distinguish between moratorium and default. A default means that Russia will decline to pay in any interest or loans, whereas moratorium means they want to delay the payment. So, and also there are the big differences in those two time period, 1998 and at the moment, because in the 1998, they had this very serious economic problems because the Soviet Union has, had just been dissolved 
in Asian countries who suffered from a lack of you know, the foreign currencies could not purchase the oil from Russia. But now the current problem is absolutely diplomatic and political issue. Well, at the moment, the Russian exposure of Korean banks amount to $1.4 billion. That takes only 1.4% out of the overall the Russian exposure owned by the global banks. Now, the overall the Russian exposure amounts to uh, uh, $1.5 billion, and 75% of overall Russian exposure is owned by four major countries, such as France, Italy, United States, and Austria. So if they declare, Russia declares default or merge, which is very, very unlikely, that I should say that there should be a very limited impact in Korean economy. But uh, European countries and particularly European countries may have different story. Right, and talking about the Korean economy, Professor Oh, given the uncertainties mm -hmm. in light of Kremlin's war in Ukraine, Moody's has lowered Korea's growth outlook for this year to 2.7%. Mm -hmm. But authorities here in the country I have vowed to secure a 3.1% economic growth this mm -hmm. particular year. What are your prospects? Uh, uh, because due to uh, the raising uncertainties, the global and then the domestic economy uh, is surrounded by uh, totally uncertainty. So therefore, I agree uh, with the uh, downward revision of economic growth uh, with a range of less than 3% and uh, just above 2.5% because the uh, Korean economy uh, should have been affected very negatively afterward. And the price uh, of energy and raw material, uh, this is very important for Korean economy. Uh, it composes of the uh, cost of production, um, and uh, the, this kind of uh, price is rising, and the price of agriculture is rising, and then eventually interest rates is rising. This is the situation that Korea uh, have to face. Uh, when the price of input or a factor of uh, production uh, uh, rise, it is called a cost push inflation. Uh, cost push inflation uh, would uh, trigger chain reaction of the uh, decreasing uh, production, uh, decreasing uh, investment, and then as a result, uh, decreasing the level of improvement, and finally, at uh, the level of consumption decrease in the market. So when it triggers uh, the, this kind of vicious cycle, uh, then the economy goes into the trap of stagflation. Uh, it is very, uh, uh, I, I might say that it is very, uh, imminent and then uh, vulnerable to uh, the risk of the stagflation. And then as for the inflationary pressure, uh, the soaring prices because of uh, one of the factors might, might be uh, increased liquidity due to uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but the external factors like uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, that, uh, it is unavo unavoidable. Uh, it is uh, totally unavo unavoidable risk. And more than anything else, if the uh, crude price break the $130 mark, uh, this year's consumer price is expected uh, to uh, reach just 4% uh, of 4%. Uh, so in addition, red alarm uh, is on the foreign exchange rate. Uh, weakening currency means that uh, uh, it will boost up the inflation uh, uh, because uh, so we uh, procure the raw material and energy as an import. Uh, so uh, when the Korean won depreciate, uh, and the value of import uh, increase. Uh, so uh, the uh, sourcing cost of production will uh, soar up. Uh, the next administration uh, might face uh, these kind of challenges and then uh, they have to keep balance between controlling money supply and then maintaining stability uh, in the market, uh, which is uh, uh, pop, uh, far from the populism. Right. It would be a daunting task, of course, mm -hmm. right. for the new incoming administration. Professor Yang, Moody's has also claimed that Korea will be affected by disruptions in the supply of key material needed within its semiconductor and automobile industries. Having said that, what can be done to address this upcoming reality? Well, that is a big concern, actually, in our economy, because Jerome Powell, this chairperson of uh, the FL, already declared that uh, the current problem with the, uh, the, uh, of the war between Russia and Ukraine may cause big, big disruptions in global supply chains. Well, we, you know, the manufacturing is a major driver for the Korean economy, and uh, there are many, many critical natural resources that may help and work as ingredients for our manufacturing facilities. And we have very high dependency on Russia for many, many, you know, natural resources. For example, we may, we purchase uh, the uh, neon and xenon, et cetera, for semiconductors and lithium, nickel for 
the automobile, to the secondary batteries, and now uh, for uh, petrochemicals and para-silicon for steel industry. Mm -hmm. The major problem for all these natural resources is first, Russia has very, very high market share. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really tough for Korean manufacturing firms to find out an alternative, mm -hmm. you know, the importing sources. Secondly, the price of all these natural resources have increased almost like by 40% and 50% this year. And the third problem with this one is, you know, uh, we do not have any you know, predefined reserve strategy to deal with all this, you know, the abruptions. Ab ab mm -hmm. For example, in the, you may know, you may heard the, uh, uh, the resource diplomacy that was started in the government of Kim Dae-jung and inherited by Noh Mui Hyun and, and uh, the Lee Myung Bak. Well, all of a sudden, this government had canceled all these plans. Mm -hmm. So we should recover these plans because it really helps to find out the alternative sources of all these critical natural resources. Right. Meanwhile, Professor, global mm. oil prices have been rallying mm. amid the uncertainty over in Ukraine and this reality itself looks to hamstring economic mm -hmm. expansion. Right. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, as Professor Yang commented about, uh, it's time to think about uh, uh, energy uh, diplomacy. And then uh, I think that increasing trend of this kind of energy will continue even after the uh, Russian-Ukraine crisis. Uh, and uh, Goldman Sachs raised its uh, 2022 Brent crude spot price forecast to uh, $135 a barrel. Uh, which is uh, from a previous hour of uh, 98, uh, 98 uh, dollars. So it is a high jump uh, compared to the previous year. Uh, the, sp uh, the steepest pace uh, since the oil shock in the uh, 1970s. Uh, just as it takes uh, three to, uh, to four weeks uh, of, of fluctuation uh, in the global crude oil prices uh, to be reflected in the domestic uh, energy prices. Uh, so the increase in uh, this kind of uh, energy price is likely to hit the domestic market uh, might be early April. Uh, so uh, then the inflation among consumer prices uh, quickening faster than expected uh, and uh, the inflationary pressure uh, the Korean economy will face might be uh, tougher and tougher as time goes. And the price rise last month was 3.7% uh, from a year or, earlier well over the central bank's target rate of 2%. And uh, the speed of this kind of oil price uh, hike will be uh, lessened because Korea decided to release 4.2% to 4 million barrel of oil uh, from the emergency reserves uh, to help uh, stabilize uh, the uh, energy prices. Uh, even though it is a minimal effect, but the uh, government also uh, uh, tried to extend the fuel tax, uh, tax cut by uh, three months. Uh, in spite of this, the country's manufacturing industries rely heavily on the, the imports for energy and, and, uh, and the nation only uh, returned to a trade surplus in uh, February after two, uh, two months uh, uh, trade deficit caused by uh, energy prices. So uh, once again, uh, as uh, Professor Yang commented about, it is very important uh, for Korean uh, economy to think about uh, uh, made, uh, made a, a kind of a supplement to uh, alternative way of uh, sourcing uh, the energies. Right, and staying with the concerns raised by Professor, oh, Professor Yang, this is the million dollar question. What preparations do you propose to better prepare perhaps for a prolonged conflict then over in Ukraine? Well, I can think about a couple of very, uh, you know, their parallel approaches. First one is about uh, diplomacy. Mm. You know, the Russia is very likely to uh, you know, approach China to, uh, you know, get more weapons or to recover their economic damages. So, but you know, that there's a very serious tension between China and, and the United States. And from the geological you know, locations, we cannot take only one side, you know, uh, at random. So we should take uh, very, very sincere and very serious, you know, the uh, compromise between you know, China mm. and uh, the United States, even in dealing with this, uh, the, the conflict between the Russia and the Ukraine. The second, then, when it comes to the economic situations, many people are talking about the impact of uh, the, uh, the oil problems in the world market, but our dependency on Russian oil, which is only 5%. United States has 8%, whereas European countries have a different story. They have uh, up to 25% for, you know, depending on Russia to, uh, for the oil import. So the, the more serious problem in our case, again, is on natural resources. So we should work very hard to find out the alternative sources. 
and uh, setting up the new uh, strategy and uh, the government or institutions to explore the real new natural minerals and resources in overseas, etc. So those are a couple of very, very critical steps for our government. Right, we need to diversify our market right. then. Exactly. Professor O, the US Federal Reserve on Monday spoke mm. about the need to adopt an aggressive monetary policy mm. to tame inflation. Right. How does this stance look to affect the financial market, do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, as Sonny commented about the U.S. Fed, uh, Chair Jerome Powell uh, announced the interest rate uh, increase by 25 basis point. Uh, the rate increase is uh, within the market's expectation. Uh, it, it is not a surprise, but uh, Powell added uh, that the Fed is prepared to move uh, more aggressively if inflation continues to build up. Uh, in addition, the uh, Fed lowered its uh, U.S. GDP growth uh, uh, projection for this year uh, to 2.8 percent uh, from the previous forecast of 4 percent. Uh, go back to the uh, response of the financial market uh, in Korea. Uh, Bank of Korea uh, moved its reference rate uh, by 25 basis point uh, this January. And in February and March, uh, they, uh, Bank of Korea do not uh, increase the interest rate. Uh, there are many reasons, but uh, uh, according to the finance theory, the uh, so-called interest rate parity theorem, uh, interest gap between two countries uh, should be kept in, uh, uh, in any situation, if not the capital price from one country to the other country happen. Uh, think about it, when uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, increased the interest rate, uh, but the Bank of Korea do not change the interest rate, uh, the interest gap uh, might be uh, widened. So in that case, uh, that the uh, capital uh, movement from one country to the other happen. So in a way to avoid this kind of situation, uh, uh, there is no other choice for uh, Bank of Korea to increase or, or step up consecutively the interest rate. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, might be uh, those kind of uh, hike uh, deferred to uh, the April. And then uh, I might say that uh, in, uh, in May, uh, there must be kind of a sharp increase of interest uh, uh, rate increase in Korea. And then the financial outlook uh, remains very uncertain. Uh, a potential debt to deport by Russia could result in a, a global liquidity squeeze, uh, which triggers capital withdrawal from emerging market, uh, including Korea, uh, to other countries. And then investors took a wait and see uh, attitude uh, stemming from the hope for progress in the uh, peace talk between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, we already know that uh, at this time of uncertainty, investors all, always pay attention uh, to the short-term profit-taking uh, strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. And staying with the same issue, Professor Yang, what more can you tell us about the potential impact of further rate hikes by the U.S. Federal Reserve on the monetary policy direction of Korea's central bank? Well, the region understand that the major driver for the FLB's decision to increase the base rate is on inflation. In February, the United States has the highest CPI increase, 7.9%, mm -hmm. which is the worst, worst, and you know, biggest the, the, uh, the inflation in the last 40 years. And uh, last month in Korea, we had a CPI increase about by 3.7%, which is the highest after 2011. So, you know, we have new president, and uh, he will absolutely appoint a new uh, leader, chair of, uh, you know, the Korean bank. And uh, we also have the special committee organized by the, uh, the, the, the chairperson uh, to determine the new uh, best rate. And many people assume that the United States and FLB will increase the, uh, the base rate up to 1.9%, which is also declared by uh, Jerome Powell by the end of this year. And next year, three, uh, through the three more meetings, the, base in the interest will increase up to about 2.5 or 2.7. Mm -hmm. That means our interest will be a little higher than the FLB to you know, lock lock up the, uh, the current currencies, uh, the foreign currencies in, in current market. So by the end of this year, our, the base rate will move up to like, you know, the 2%. And next year, many people are really concerned that our base rate will even go farther to 3%. So that is very, very pessimistic, the, uh, the forecasting for this year and next year's best interest. Right, I see. And Professor, are there any other risk factors mm -hmm. to economic stability mm -hmm. that we need to keep an eye on? All right. 
uh, I might say that as an external factors, uh, we have to pay attention to uh, three factors. Uh, more than anything, our top priority might be uh, the progress of peace talk between Russia and Ukraine, uh, which is the source of uncertainty uh, uh, now. And then uh, it is a, a kind of string uh, with the inflationary pressure and interest rate hike expectation and so on. Uh, but the second thing we have to uh, pay attention to is uh, the China. Uh, because uh, China is the number one trade partner of Korea, but uh, nowadays uh, Chinese economy uh, is, uh, um, uh, is not that uh, good. Uh, I mean that uh, stagnant pay, uh, pace. And then uh, in spite of this, that uh, China uh, m might uh, take a step to, to support uh, uh, Russia economically or politically, uh, then which might uh, trigger severe consequences for Korean uh, potentially to export in China. And the last thing uh, we have to uh, think about it is the movement of Japanese yen. Uh, because uh, at this uh, situation uh, between uh, the U uh, EU uh, and the Russia, uh, the US and China, uh, so uh, the capital market is inundated with uh, total uncertainties. Uh, at this time, relatively speaking, uh, for the time being, that uh, Japanese yen uh, might, be, uh, re uh, might be reported as a safe harbor uh, for the uh, capital investors. So in that sense that the uh, Japanese yen uh, might be uh, the final destination for uh, global uh, investors, uh, uh, kind of the, what I'm saying, the risk management, uh, risk managing tool. Uh, so you're proposing that I should be buying the yen? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Young, finally, uh -huh. what words of advice would you like to share with the incoming administration as it seeks to take the reins of the country this May? Well, I should recommend to diversify the uh, sourcing of natural resources because the manufacturing is a major driver for our economy and all these creative resources take up up to 75% of the major mm. costs and prices of our finished goods. So for example, there are 3,000 natural resources you know, uh, through which we depend on 80% you know, of the import. And China is a major country you know, that we have a high dependency on importing all those mm -hmm. natural resources. Well, we already had a similar experience before, I mean, through the trade conflict with Japan for parts, equipment, and also urea problems from Japan to uh, you know, fuel your, your automobiles. So we should strengthen our internal capabilities to uh, you know, produce all those natu uh, you know, natural uh, ingredients, and also we should diversify. Right, the sourcing of those materials. So that should be critical, critical advice I want to give mm. to the new government. Right, all right then, Professor Yang, thank you as always for your words. Professor Oh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this edition. We'll be back same time tomorrow with more coverage. Do join us then. Thank you for now. <laughs>